Welcome back to Hardware Unboxed. Today's video is not something I was originally expecting to make. We don't often do specific laptop reviews on this channel, but over the last few months, I've been spending a lot of time with the ASUS Tough Gaming A15, and, well, I have a few thoughts I need to get off my chest about this particular system. As you might have seen from the title of this video, the Tough Gaming A15 is a bad laptop in my opinion, and to be very clear, it has absolutely nothing to do with the AMD APU that ASUS has chosen to use here. The new Ryzen 4000 processors are extremely capable, they're fast, they're efficient, and they're clearly quite affordable for OEMs, so everything I've said in my previous reviews specifically looking at those APUs I think is still totally valid. The problems with the Tough Gaming A15 are squarely on ASUS and the job they've done with this entry-level budget laptop. Now, I've tested three A15s at this point. Two of them I've bought, the FA506iU, which has the Ryzen 7 4800H and GeForce GTX 1660 Ti, as well as the FA506ii with the Ryzen 5 4600H and GTX 1650 Ti. The other one, this one here, is the one that ASUS has loaned me, the FA506iV, that has the 4800H and the RTX 2060. So I've been testing most of the main configurations configurations available, and I've spent my own money to buy two of these systems. And after spending all this time with the laptop testing out everything, there are just far too many problems with the way ASUS has designed this laptop and the other components they've chosen for me to recommend anyone actually buy this system. It's been getting a lot of hype, so this is probably going to disappoint people and probably even anger a few ASUS fanboys, but I think ASUS has screwed up this laptop in a few ways. The first issue that I want to talk about is the atrocious cooler design. Some of the design decisions ASUS has made here are just baffling. So let's walk through each of the problems with how this cooler is designed. And disclaimer, you know, I'm not a cooling engineer, but as you'll see in a moment, some of these problems are just, well, laughably bad. So first up, on the right side of this laptop is one of the laptop's three exhaust vents for the cooler. Well, at least two of the models have this vent, the 1650 Ti model doesn't have the vent at all, but the higher TDP GPU variants do. What's absolutely baffling to me is this vent solution. ASUS have made a seven segment grill here and it's split into there's an upper and a bottom row. But on that bottom row, as you can see here, four of the seven vents are blocked by a piece of plastic. So for four sevenths of the exhaust port, air can only move through this tiny top section. Then I thought, okay, Maybe this exhaust port only has a heatsink for that top part. That would be weird, but I guess it's a possibility. Well, I opened up the laptop and yeah, that section is also blocked by metal. I believe this is to force the air out through the top portion of the heatsink, which is you know not blocked by plastic, but why block it at all? Why not just let the air flow freely through an unblocked port? But even worse than this are the intake ports, which are just pathetic. I mean, the underside has just four intake sections, which are all tiny. One of them, this one, intakes directly over the RAM where ASUS has placed a piece of paper, presumably to redirect airflow. But this reduces clearance between the intake port and the components in that underside part of the chassis, potentially limiting airflow. Not that it matters given the actual intake hole is so small. This leaves one primary intake hole for the right cooler, this tiny hole here, and it's not even over the place where the fan is actually located. And then on the left, this side with the blocked exhaust vent, we have just two small holes. Again, none of them are actually over the fan hole. There's also a small hole uh, between the two exhaust vents along the rear edge, although I'm not sure exactly whether it's for intake or exhaust. It's pretty far away from either thing. And yeah, again, none of these vents line up directly with the cooling fan, so it doesn't make a lot of sense. And for getting their heat pipe set up and all of that stuff for now, the cooling design here is simply set up to choke the coolers. It's it's inexplicable to have such tiny intake ports and partially blocked exhaust ports on a modern gaming laptop, even if it's for an entry-level system. I also don't see how this sort of design saves ASUS any cost whatsoever. I mean, using a different plastic base panel for the laptop with larger cooling vents surely would not have cost them much more money. And when I was first testing the A15, I thought this sort of design with limited cooling vents was standard for entry-level laptops, but 
That all changed when I checked out the MSI GL65 a few weeks ago. So to set the stage here, my GL65 review unit had the same RTX 2060 GPU inside. It used an Intel Core i7 10750H processor, and it, it had a similar configuration otherwise, a few changes to storage and so on, but largely the same. These are also similarly priced systems, at least in the USA and parts of Europe, not so much in Australia where the GL65 is massively overpriced. But in the US, for example, the A15 with the RTX 2060 sets you back $1,200, while the GL65 with the RTX 2060 is $1,300. So $100 or 8% price difference. And let's take a look at what that difference gets you in terms of the cooler. So MSI have clearly designed the GL65 to actually be a decent budget laptop because we have three large exhaust vents on the side, nothing is blocked or flow limited, it's just pure ventilation for the heat sinks. Then on the bottom, and I didn't get B-roll of this, so we're looking at a photo from PCMag here, there is a huge bottom vent that is seen across all the crucial components, allowing plenty of room for air intake. None of this small, tiny intake vent rubbish. MSI are using a vent so large you can actually see the fans and the heat sinks inside. The internal difference is also significant. ASUS are using a bargain basement three main heat pipe solution, two for the APU and GPU combined, and then there's an extra one for the GPU. There's a fourth small heat pipe, if you want to count that as well, likely for GDDR6, maybe some VRM cooling. MSI, on the other hand, they're using, and again, this is from Notebook Checks Teardown, they're using seven heat pipes. The CPU here on the right has four heat pipes, two of which are shared with the GPU and two are dedicated. Then the GPU gets an additional two dedicated heat pipes, plus a third for the VRM and memory up the top. So what does this difference in cooler combined with the additional intake and exhaust room do to thermal performance? Well, let's make a comparison. First up is Handbrake X265 encoding. We have the same benchmark that we use for our main CPU reviews, the A15 for 47 watts of average CPU power usage during our capture, ran the CPU at 88 degrees Celsius and with 50.3 dBA of cooler noise from 50 centimeters away. The GL65 is significantly superior. Not only can it run the CPU at 62 watts sustained using the turbo power profile, it does so at 92 degrees C, so it is a little bit hotter, but with just 43.7 dBA of noise. So the GL65 is running the CPU at a higher wattage with a much quieter fan system. Gaming is where it gets even worse for the A15. In Watch Dogs 2, I saw 97 degrees C on the CPU, 78 C on the GPU, and that's with roughly 40 watts of CPU power usage and 90 watts on the GPU. Same cooler noise as previous. The MSI GL65 ran the same test at 86 degrees C on the CPU, 80 degrees C on the GPU, but with higher power draw, 45 watts for the CPU and 115 watts for the GPU. That's a combined 30 watts more power dissipation the cooler is handling at lower temperatures on the CPU and lower noise output. Then I thought, okay, well, just how badly is ASUS gimping this cooling solution with their terrible intake vents? So I decided to run the entire system with the base plastic cover removed. I also taped over the gap between the cooling fan and the heat sinks to force airflow from the cooler to the heat sinks. The bottom cover of the laptops will do this, but with it removed, that gap needed to be addressed. I also raised the laptop by four millimeters from the desk, otherwise the fan would be entirely blocked by the desk as the rubber pads raising the laptops aren't present either. The results, well, with the exact same component power draw in each of the three tests, I saw massive temperature reductions. In Handbrake, the CPU ran a full 6 degrees Celsius cooler. In Ida64, with a CPU and FPU workload, it ran 6 degrees cooler as well. And when playing Watch Dogs 2, the CPU ran a massive 10 degrees Celsius cooler, and the GPU, instead of running at 78 degrees Celsius, ran at 68 degrees Celsius, with roughly the same fan speeds. So if ASUS had paid any attention whatsoever to how they were getting air into the cooler, a solution which likely wouldn't have cost them much money or engineering effort, we could have seen a significant reduction in temperatures. With that could come, well, several things. We could have lower fan noise, or perhaps a boost to component power usage, say increasing the RTX 2060 up to 115 watts, bringing with it better performance. And given MSI have shown that you can put a good cooling solution into a budget gaming laptop, what ASUS has done with the A15 is pretty baffling to me. But that's not the only complaint about the tough A15 and why I think it's a bad poorly made product. 
The other main one is the display, which is a hot garbage. All A15 models use the Panda LM156LF2F01, which when you look at the basic specs, seems reasonable. It's 15.6 inch, it's 1080p, 144Hz IPS display, and that's similar to many other budget laptops, including the MSI GL65. But then you actually test the panel, and yeah, an average gray to gray response time of 18.6 milliseconds is terrible. It's well below standard for a 144Hz panel, and well short of the required 6.94 millisecond response time you need to actually complete the transition within the refresh window. So this leads to a significant amount of smearing, which is super obvious on any UFO test. The blur and ghosting is pretty unbelievable here. The other issue is a bad color gamut, just 66% of sRGB or thereabouts. This makes the panel look undersaturated when viewing sRGB content, a little bit washed out and just not as vibrant as you would get from a true 100% sRGB panel. And I've mentioned a few times that in 2020, the baseline standard for any sort of display is around the 100% sRGB mark. It's just not good enough to use something that can't display all the colors used for modern processing. None of these results are a surprise when you look at the specifications for the Panda panel. It clearly lists 66% sRGB coverage and a 25 millisecond rise plus fall response time. These are low quality specifications indicative of an extremely cheap panel. In contrast, MSI with their GL65 also offer a 15.6 inch 1080p 144Hz IPS display, but they are using the LG LP156WFG. Listed on the spec page for this display is 99% sRGB coverage and a 5 millisecond typical grey to grey transition time. Unfortunately, I didn't have enough time with the GL65 to do a full response time measurement on it, but I did look at the UFO test and the results were noticeably better, not to mention sRGB coverage around 95% instead of 66%, which leads to a more vibrant, better image. I also briefly looked at the specs for several other popular budget laptop offerings and what displays they are using. The Acer Predator Helios 300, for example, uses the AU Optronics B156HAN08.2, which has 93% sRGB coverage and a 9 millisecond rise plus fall response time according to its spec sheet. The Lenovo Y540, another budget example, uses a BOE NV156FHM N4G, again, 9 millisecond rise plus for response time and 95% sRGB coverage. So these sorts of 144Hz IPS type panels with respectable performance seem quite common in these more entry budget level gaming laptops. Now I don't know the unit price for the Panda panel ASUS has used across the Tough A15 lineup. For all I know, it is a much cheaper panel than the LG, AU Optronics or BOE alternatives that are often used. But this is a competitive market and not including a reasonable quality display is another mark against this device that could swing a prospective buyer to something else. And while the Panda panel isn't great for gaming, what really stings is that it isn't great for creators either. Say you're interested in the Tough Gaming A15 for its excellent video encoding performance, or for how it performs in Premiere as a whole, or its very competitive DaVinci Resolve performance. You know, I saw a performance lead in the 10% range for mixed CPU and GPU tasks like Premiere or DaVinci encoding over the MSI GL65. Even Photoshop, with, which generally favors Intel, was faster. And this lead can extend to 30 or even 50% in pure CPU tasks like two-pass Premiere encodes, handbrake, or Blender CPU rendering. So as a creator, yeah, it's nice to get that bit of extra performance, especially in those CPU demanding workloads, but when the display is rubbish, why would you want to edit photos or videos on the device? If color reproduction isn't in the same ballpark as accurate, that really hurts for those key production workloads where the A15 has a significant performance advantage thanks to Ryzen. Not including a good quality display to go along with that performance has crippled this laptop for productivity. There are also some just really bizarre skew choices for this device depending on the region. For us here in Australia, it's impossible to get the version that comes with a 90 watt hour battery. It just doesn't exist on the market. Instead, you just get a bunch of blank space inside the system and just a 48 watt hour cell. For $1,200, buyers in the United States get treated to the 4800H model with an RTX 2060 and 90 watt hour battery. But then in the US, why isn't the model with the 4900H available when it is in places like the UK? And why does that model have the 48 watt hour battery? It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. 
at the end of the day, you know, I'm just, I'm frustrated with what we have from this first Ryzen 4000 laptop from ASUS that delivers excellent CPU performance, but is compromised in many other ways to the point where it is hard to recommend to anyone. Because the cooler is so bad, ASUS has only been able to run the RTX 2060 at 90 watts. MSI's far superior GL65 cooler can easily handle the RTX 2060 at 115 watts with less fan noise, and that leads to a 7% performance advantage in games on average. Some of the most GPU demanding titles like Control or Red Dead Redemption 2 are up to 15% faster. Given the GL65 as configured is just $100 or 8% more expensive with a superior display, it makes it hard to recommend the A15 as a budget gaming option, because even though the GL65 does feature a weaker Core i7-10750H CPU, it doesn't matter all that much for gaming and ends up being the faster device overall, as the cooler can handle that higher power RTX 2060 configuration. And then for productivity, sure, if you are doing something that doesn't require a high quality display, like code compiling for example, the power of the Ryzen 7 4800H is hard to ignore and the A15 will be a much faster choice than the GL65. But for creator workloads, 66% sRGB coverage from the awful Panda panel used here severely limits the otherwise great creator performance. It's such a frustrating problem because if ASUS had chosen basically any other 144Hz IPS laptop display, this wouldn't have been an issue. And not only that, the cooler once again is only able to sustain around 45 watts of CPU power at a pretty hot temperature with loud fans. If we had MSI's cooling solution in this laptop, could we have seen even better thermals, better sustained power draw for better performance, lower noise? I mean, that would have made the laptop an even more compelling choice for productivity. Like I said at the start, none of this is AMD's fault. They've made the silicon, it's great, it performs well, it's efficient, but then ASUS goes and puts it in a bad entry-level laptop, and I'm sure AMD are just as frustrated as I was seeing one of the first Zen 2 H-series laptops on the market with such compromised hardware. Perhaps I'm even more frustrated as I actually paid money for two of these systems. I'm not really sure what I'm going to do with them because I don't really have much interest in using them with all these issues. Uh, but yeah, I spent some serious money on these. So if you are interested in buying a Ryzen 4000 laptop to gain the power of something like the Ryzen 7 4800H or even the great entry-level Ryzen 5 4600H, my advice at this point is to wait for a more competent solution from a different OEM. There are a number of other budget Ryzen laptops sitting in the market soon. We have the, the Dell G5 Special Edition, we've got the MSI Bravo 15, there's a new HP Omen 15, and there's also new systems coming from Lenovo and Acer. Yes, there is still a lack of high-end Ryzen 4000 laptops with GPUs above an RTX 2060, but surely one of these other OEMs will be able to nail down the budget market and get basic aspects to the design right, like the cooler and the display. I also hope ASUS takes this feedback on board and improves the next generation of the A15 design. A change as simple as you know, updating that bottom intake vent so that it's not completely terrible would significantly improve several aspects to this laptop and make it a much more compelling buy in the budget market. And I also want to say that while I have been talking a lot about the MSI GL65 in this video, I'm not saying that you should go out and buy that laptop instead either. I still haven't tested a quite a number of other budget contenders in the laptop market. My plan is to, yeah, test out as many of those as I possibly can, including stuff like the Gigabyte Aorus 5, some of those new Lenovo, Acer, Dell systems. I want to get a comprehensive roundup and look at which of these laptops is going to give you the best performance. But just comparing those two laptops, A15 to GL65, there's just no way I could recommend the A15 in its current state, considering MSI is competently designing their budget laptops. So yeah, that's it for this one. Bit of a bit of a rant video, bit of a teardown on the A15. Again, pretty disappointed in what ASUS has done with this laptop, and I've, I'm stuck with two of these things now, so yeah, not quite sure what I'm going to be doing with them. Let me know your thoughts on some of the design decisions that ASUS has made here, particularly with that cooler. I'm interested to hear what you think of the things that they've done with that cooler design and why you think they might have blocked some of the cooling vents and really choked up the intake vents there. So yeah, interested in your feedback. As always, we appreciate the support of all of our Patreon members. We really can't put ads on a video like this, at least in-stream ads. So the support that we get from all of you guys, links in the description below is, yeah, it's fantastic. And yeah, subscribe for more laptop testing. I'll catch you in the next one.